The coast of British Columbia and where I live is so unimaginably beautiful. We have eagles, we have bears, we have whales as our next door neighbors. Hey. Alexandra Morton lives and works as a self-trained biologist in the remote and ecologically diverse Broughton Archipelago, about 230 miles north of Vancouver, British Columbia. And I've lived out here for 26 years. I came to study killer whales, so I lived on a boat with my husband and we traveled all over looking for the perfect place and we followed whales to Echo Bay and it had whales and it had wild salmon. Today, the killer whales have vanished and Morton is concerned that the wild salmon they depended on are under threat as well. Few expected Morton to put down roots here. In 1986, her wildlife filmmaker husband Robin drowned, but she vowed to stay and continued their research on the killer whales in this demanding area. Here in Echo Bay, we have no electricity unless you make it yourself. We have no ferry boats, no malls, no roads. Uh, you, ha you have to be extremely resourceful. I just, I simply took one breath and, and fell in love with this place. It is, is a lovely, lovely part of the world, it's very vibrant. Morton has supported herself in the Broughton by writing popular books on the orca and operating a research station. But now she spends much of her time raising awareness about aquaculture. When the wild salmon started to be impacted by fish farms, my research has slowly changed over to doing research on the impact of aquaculture. A few fish farms first came to the Broughton in the late 1970s. And today, salmon aquaculture is a $450 million a year business here. Uh, we're at Midsummer Island. It's a production site for marine harvest. And uh, there's 10 cages here. We're in the Broughton Archipelago about 550,000 fish on site. The global aquaculture company Marine Harvest raises imported Atlantic salmon at eight fish farms like this in the Broughton. At any given time, there are 70 to 80 farms in Vancouver's waters producing millions of pounds of fish, most of it bound for U.S. markets. Farmed salmon has been a controversial product for years. The Seafood Watch program of the Monterey Bay Aquarium advises consumers to avoid farmed salmon arguing that aquaculture breeds diseases and threatens already overfished oceans. Many environmental groups, however, encourage diners to eat wild salmon from healthy runs. The salmon are the keystone species of this ecosystem because they bring in the nutrients from the open ocean and they feed so many species here. They are what make it work. While there are few salmon farms in Maine and in Washington, the state of Alaska has outlawed fin fish farms amidst fears that they might negatively impact the state's valuable wild fishery. Morton says that's exactly what has happened here in the Broughton. When the fish farms came to town, they seemed like a good idea, but diseases started to appear, toxic algae blooms, the whales vanished, and pretty soon I realized that the whole ecosystem was crumbling under the weight of this industry. It's a black bear, a mama black bear grazing. She looks so skinny and she's got two babies she's nursing and she's trying to gain weight on grass and berries, but she really needs the salmon to return to the rivers. Wild salmon returns, particularly for pink and chum species, have fluctuated from year to year. But a pink salmon population crash in 2002 left many wondering if the farms and a parasite called the sea lice were to blame. So that's a coho salmon. It has a few sea lice, but that's completely natural. Sea lice are actually a crustacean, just like a crab, but they're a parasitic crustacean that lives on a fish. So what happens in the wild is they just get a few lice. And in the fall, the wild fish go into the rivers and they die, and the sea lice die, and the coast is clean. And when the little fish come out in the spring, there's no sea lice. But what happens in the farms is the wild fish go by, transfer a few of these lice, and in the spring, the little salmon come out of the rivers and they're too young. They don't have any scales, and so the sea lice get on them and kill them. Morton now does regular sea lice studies, catching juvenile wild salmon and counting the parasites. 109 millimeters as um, moat scars. There's the louse, female louse. Last year, she and her collaborators published a paper in the journal Science reporting that sea lice are killing enough juvenile pink salmon to ensure a local extinction within a decade. Fish farmers don't deny that their farms contribute to the problem. Well, this is, it's a source. Yeah, there's definitely some. There's, I can't say there's no lice there, but there's, um, you know, prior to 2000, we had fire higher counts because we, weren't, we didn't, weren't regulated to treat. 
The Canadian government requires farmers to treat their fish with a chemical anti-lice pesticide. And scientists from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans say that there's more than just sea lice affecting wild salmon returns. It's one thing to say whether farms contribute lice to the natural environment. You can measure that, and we know that that's the case now. Uh, it's another thing to then study the small salmon and see whether if they're infected that they have a higher mortality. We, we know that now. But the step from when juvenile salmon leave the coastal zone and come back a year later is a big unknown. There's no question that there are other determinants of the final number of fish that come back to spawn. There you go. Good luck. Other way. Come back. <laughs> come back when you're all grown up. But to Morton, damage from the sea lice is proof that the fish farms should be closed, moved further offshore, or into containers on land. When the fish farms say it's too expensive for them to go into the closed tank, the question is, is it too expensive for who? Because my community right now is paying the bill. The bears, the eagles, the whales, they're paying the bill right now. The problem is not aquaculture. The problem is where you farm. Don't get in the way of the wild salmon. Allow them to come and go to the ocean, and everything flourishes around them. We have a national policy in Canada called the Policy for the Conservation of Wild Pacific Salmon. If the situation arose that we were finding evidence that the Broughton, for example, didn't have that productivity compared to other areas, then the salmon farms would be a possible source of that impact. And if we could not effectively manage them, then you'd have to reduce the risk. Now the government is taking input from environmentalists and independent scientists to create a new management model for the Broughton. But ultimately, Morton says, the decision to continue salmon farming rests in consumers' hands. The best thing people can do is just stop buying the farm fish and to make it clear that they would buy farm fish perhaps if they were raised sustainably in closed containment. But this whole thing is driven by the consumer. The consumer thinks they don't have any power, they think they're an individual among the masses and they can't do anything about it. Actually, it's the consumer that's in control. So. If you want to save these wild salmon, don't buy the farm fish. Actually, buy wild salmon.